checking account so we can make payroll for like grand pay entrance for yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. teacher payroll in late August. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the regular meeting of the Watertown Board of Education. Today's date <coughs> is Monday, August 28th, 2017. On July 29th of this year, this community lost one of our own, Vincent Camarada, in a tragic automobile accident. On Thursday of this week, Vincent would have celebrated his 18th birthday. And in honor tonight, we will remember him. The son of Michael Camarada and Christine McGrath Camarada, Vincent was born in Waterbury before moving to Watertown. He attended John Trumbull Primary School, Judson Elementary School, Swift Middle School, and Watertown High School, before becoming a part of the class of 2017 at his beloved Cedarhurst School in Hamden, Hamden, Connecticut. He was enrolled in an entrepreneurship program at Albertus Magnus College. He was an avid gamer, and loved all things music. Our thoughts are with his sister Victoria, his loving grandparents, aunts, cousins, uncles, and his girlfriend Nicolette. His engaging personality and enthusiasm will be sorely missed by all who knew him and all those who have since come to know his story. Please join me in observing a moment of silence in Vincent's honor. Thank you. While the tragic loss and the circumstances of Vincent's death stunned our school community, our school counselors, school psychologists, and administrators from all five schools responded immediately to help. Not only our students, but the entire community. While they themselves, our staff, our administrators, were mourning the loss as well. Our staff members held a crisis team meeting on a Saturday planned community responses and interventions, attended wake and funeral services with the students, and facilitated a counseling session at the high school for staff and students. In addition, as is often the case, they went above and beyond, particularly in checking in on the family and students affected throughout the remainder of the summer. They recognize how important it is that the students and staff know they have a place to find comfort amongst their peers and to get the resources that they need. On behalf of the Board of Education, I want to share our deepest appreciation for all that our administrators, faculty, and staff have done since the news of Vinny's passing became public. There were many difficult moments since then for all of us, but amidst the sorrow, there were remarkable moments too. It's difficult to put into words the incredible poise and compassion showcased by our team at Vincent's Wake. As students collapsed in the arms of our administrators, our school psychiatrists and psychologists, collapsed in their arms in both anguish and in relief in seeing them there. There were students sometimes twice their size crumbling in grief at the sight of the outstretched arms of one of our staff members. The administrators and staff's ability to be there for all of our students, not just Watertowns, was remarkable. I will never forget their composure, nor their compassion, at a time when it was needed most. Under their leadership, I am thankful and comforted to know that with administrators and staff like that leading the way, Watertown Public Schools will continue to provide compassionate assistance to our students and to each other throughout the upcoming school year. I ask that we all please rise for the salute to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mindy? further in the agenda, I would like to add a new business item to tonight's agenda. As a matter of process, this can be done if two-thirds of board members present agree to the new item. I'd like to make a motion to add state budget update as a new agenda item this evening. Do I have a second? Second. 
All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. The new agenda item will become E, and all other items will now follow that alphabetically. Moving on to item D, minutes, Board of Education regular meeting minutes from July 24th. Did everybody receive the updated minutes via email today? Yes. I appreciate the correction that was made, adding Ms. Janelle Wilk into the minutes. Is there a motion? So moved. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? One abstention. Motion carries. First, I'd like to thank Senator Eric Berthel for being here this evening at our request to give us an update on the budget. Before I do that, I have a few statements I would like to make about the process um, on the school side. Throughout the summer, the board has been working hard to stay closely informed on the state's plan for school and municipal funding as it relates to Watertown. And to make sure that Watertown students, taxpayers, and employees are constantly on the minds of the Hartford decision makers. We've made phone calls, we've tweeted them, we've written personal notes and letters, we've joined different organizations, different policy and education associations, all to combine efforts to make sure that the voices in Watertown are heard in Hartford. July 1st marks the beginning of our new fiscal year and this week marks the official beginning of Watertown's school year sending hundreds of employees into the halls and classrooms and offices of our schools with a high level of funding uncertainty is not an ideal way for any school year to begin. Regardless of the unprecedented circumstances that put us here, it's not an effective way for any Board of edu Education in the entire state to function. But it's not our choice. No matter how the state aids end up being sliced, <laughs> We, the Board of Education, make up the largest part of this town's budget, and we have a responsibility to be ready. We will not wait to find out the actual number once a budget is passed. We will be ready for every scenario. The Board of Education Budget and Finance Chair, Mr. Tom Lambert, and I met with Dr. Cardamola and our business manager, Jill Brown, to discuss potential strategies for a variety <coughs> of state aid outcomes. As always, our superintendent, Dr. Cardamola will continue to do the important work behind the scenes, looking at every budget line item and every possible scenario that would have the least amount of impact. <coughs> the possibility of millions of dollars in cuts brings us into unprecedented territory. We don't want to make cuts all over an already lean budget, painful cuts that could potentially impact every department and every single student. <coughs> too much progress has been made in this district to let this situation rip the legs out from underneath us. Our Watertown Public Schools team has done an incredible job of saving while moving this district forward with a budget that, before health insurance increases, had a 0% increase. Thousands of collective hours has been spent by our administrators, faculty, department heads, and staff to take the education we have been providing to the next level, to instill in everyone who works and learns here that they are moving forward with us. The Watertown Board of Education will continue to urge our legislators to develop and approve a budget that supports the education of our students. In the meantime, we will remain diligent in all of our financial matters, strategize on likely scenarios, and stay current on the state budget status. And on that note, I welcome Mr. Burke. Senator Berthel, to bring us up to date on the <coughs> latest. Well, first of all, uh, thank you. As always, it's always a pleasure to come back and sit at this desk um, and to, to be with you. this Board of Education. And thank you for asking me to be here. Um, you know, I, I wish there was a really easy um, explanation I could give all of you tonight regarding what's going on in our state. I mean, unless you've been um, hiding in a forest or under a rock or uh, just off the grid, uh, you probably know, quite honestly, uh, just about as much as I do about what's going on with the, the budget situation. Um, I was very pleased, uh, Madam Chair, when you and I were at a, at a social event uh, last week, I was very pleased you, you did share with me that 
um, that you and the superintendent and members of the board had been working on some uh, some contingencies uh, already, and I think that uh, that that's very uh, prudent and smart to do. It, it shows that um, we're not a board of you're, you're not a board of education uh, that is just waiting to see what's going to happen. Uh, and there are a lot of towns, as we know, just to the north, uh, Torrington, I think, may have actually announced their start of school, but up until a few days ago said they weren't even going to begin the school year because they were so uncertain about the impact of, uh, of what the uh, legislature and, and the governor's office is doing. So um, I guess maybe we should just take a moment to talk about what we know. Okay? We know that we don't have a budget. Okay? We know that um, it is prescribed in the, uh, in the state constitution that the legislature is supposed to uh, bring forth a budget for a vote in the uh, odd-numbered years, um, a budget by May 1st, okay? Uh, now, I know that, uh, and you, you all know that in my role as a state senator and any elected official, that we represent everyone, okay? We don't just represent the party by which we were elected to office. Um, and it's, um, it's our intent when we have discussions about what's going on in our state government to not be political, okay? Uh, the reality of our situation right now is, though, that that the budget process is arguably the most political thing that happens in, um, in Hartford in the state capitol. So let me just lay out some facts without any political opinion, just facts. Uh, late, uh, late April, I want to say the 27th or the 26th, the Senate Republicans, which is the caucus that I belong to, uh, presented for discussion a budget that had been fully vetted by the Office of Fiscal Analysis, okay? It was, it was statistically and, um, I guess, mathematically correct, okay? and it had been proven by the nonpartisan Office of, of uh, Fiscal Analysis. Uh, and we asked for that budget to be brought and called for a vote, and it was not. Okay? Now, that was a few days before the statutory requirement to, to have a budget. The House Republicans, uh, before the end of the regular session, which was June 7th, also brought forth a budget that was balanced had also been, uh, been vetted, uh, that budget was also not called for a discussion. The end of the regular session came on June 7th. We entered into special session. The end of the fiscal year came on June 30th. That's when Connecticut's fiscal year uh, ends. Uh, on the afternoon of June 30th, Governor Malloy reached out to the leaders of all four caucuses in the, in the General Assembly. So the House Republicans, the House Democrats, the Senate Republicans, the Senate Democrats, and said, does anyone have a budget that we can vote on today before midnight? Because at midnight, the governor takes over control of the finances and the operation of the state of Connecticut's budget by executive order. And the governor said, and I quote, you really do not want me to run the state of Connecticut's finances by executive order. And we're seeing the reason why. We see that in the... Uh, the uh, worksheet that came out, uh, I think, a couple of weeks ago or in the last 10 days that shows these horrific cuts that would occur not only to Watertown, but to hundreds of, uh, uh, 89, I think, 89 towns took, took uh, dramatic cuts as a result of, uh, of exec uh, potentially of executive order. Now, the good news is that's not immediate. That, you know, it's not like it's going to happen tomorrow. The governor is, uh, in part, using the authority that he has given through this executive order to posture a little bit. He's uh, hopefully motivating uh, some people in the, the leadership in the various caucuses to, uh, to get us back into the Capitol and get us onto the floor of the respective chambers and get us to vote on a budget. Now, you also know that I believe it was last Wednesday, the uh, House Democrats uh, and the Speaker of the House, Representative Arasimowitz, announced that they had a budget and they dropped the budget for uh, everyone to review. And that budget actually um, is a lot better than what has been proposed by the governor through his executive uh, order. Uh, but I'm not sure that the, and again, keeping my political opinion out of this, I'm not certain that uh, the budget has enough support as we sit here tonight from enough members of the General Assembly in the House of Representatives to actually be approved. And that's the budget, if I might ask, that includes the sales 
tax increase? Yeah, that has a budget. That, that budget has a sales tax increase to 6.85% uh, from 6.35, so a half a percent. Uh, it includes taxes on uh, lots of new things. Uh, it also includes a uh, includes an income tax increase for very uh, high wage earners, and a whole bunch of other other things. Uh, my understanding is that that budget could include possibly pushing some of the teacher retirement costs back to, to the towns, which uh, we all know is something that uh, is very uh, non-palatable in, in most every community. Uh, it does, in fact, uh, provide some bailout money for the city of Hartford, which uh, uh, the only town in the state that thinks that's a good idea is the city of Hartford. Um, it uh, does away with the cap on uh, on the, the property tax cap on uh, automobiles, which you may recall in the last session there was a cap that was put in place, I think, of 37 mills, which a lot of people thought was great uh, because, you know, if you, live in, if you live just down the street in Waterbury, the mill rate in Waterbury, I think, is uh, 60 or 59 or somewhere like that. Well, you just, you know, cut your car tax bill significantly. It went from 60 mills to 37. Uh, what was not readily disclosed, you'd have to kind of go and dig for it, is that um, with that cap came a, uh, uh, a half a percent of the sales tax that's collected is taken out of the sales tax revenue and is sent back to those towns that had a mill rate that was over 37. So what we've done essentially is if you go in, and here in Watertown, our mill rate is, uh, I forget, I've got 10 towns that I worry about mill rates for, but uh, I think our mill rate is 30, 32, 32, 32, okay? So we pay our 32 mills on our, on our property. Uh, you go over to Waterbury, they're paying only 37, but the city of Waterbury still has to be made whole for <coughs> its, what is normally it's 59 or it's 60. The way that they're being made whole is when we go and every other person goes and buys something that sales tax is collected on, a half a percent of that sales tax is being diverted back to those cities that, uh, that were capped, okay? So you can see why, um, why that uh, potentially is problematic for towns like ours that are doing a good job and, and many other towns that are doing a good job of managing their finances and bringing forth responsible town budgets and town uh, education budgets. Uh, the reason why, so it probably begs the question, well, why are they going to do away, do away with it? There isn't enough revenue being collected in, the, in that half a percent of sales tax to make the cities whole, so it doesn't work. And, this is a reason why many people voted against this legislation last year, but it still had enough support to, to get out. So where are we? So that's some, some information about, about the state budget. Um, based on the, the, the best information available, which you're hearing pretty much at the same time that, that I'm hearing, believe it or not, um, it appears as though the legislature will be called back in probably the second, maybe the third week of September. And that would be to um, most likely vote on a revised version of this budget that the, Democrat, uh, the Democrats brought out last week. Okay? And we have no idea what flavor that's going to be. We have no idea what cuts, what changes um, are being made. When that budget was released on Wednesday, the Hartford Current had the budget before any legislator in the building had the budget. A Republican or a Democrat. It was released to the media before it was released to the General Assembly. Uh, the process going forward could actually be uh, very exciting to watch. Okay. Um, historically, the House of Representatives, the, the uh, Speaker of the House, will not bring forth a, an item to be voted on unless he knows that he has enough votes to pass it. So I think we can assume that if the budget gets called, and it'll, it, it's a House bill, the budget is, is in the form of a House bill, uh, that it'll pass out of the House of Representatives. It'll probably, probably pass on a very tight party line vote, okay? With maybe a couple of Democrats that will say no, they don't believe in that budget. And then it'll come upstairs to the, uh, to the Senate. As you are all probably also aware, we have this very unique uh, historic uh, ties, first time since 1893 that we've had an equal number of Republican senators and, and Democrat senators in the Senate, which made for, uh, as I walked into that uh, in February, made for a very, very interesting and very different experience in, uh, in the chamber, unlike uh, one that no one had ever seen before uh, that's alive, because I don't think there's anyone still alive from 1893. 
So, uh, but here's the reality of that. So let's say the budget comes out of the House, it passes out of the House, it comes up to the Senate floor, and let's assume that the result is the same. It, it uh, falls on a very strict party line vote. So you would have 18 senators voting yes and 18 voting no. At that point, as we know, the Lieutenant Governor, uh, who demonstrated 12 unique times during this past session, uh, has the authority as the president of the Senate to cast the tie-breaking vote. Now, what the lieutenant governor did in all of these prior 12 times is she voted with the party to which she uh, ha has her loyalty, which is the Democratic Party. I would challenge you to think for a moment about the challenge that the lieutenant governor has in this very unique situation that she might be placed in if this budget were to have an 18-18 tie. Lieutenant Governor is a Democrat. We're assuming that the Democrats would all vote yes on the budget. Does the Lieutenant Governor vote yes with her party, or does she vote no with the Governor? Now I say, why would she vote no with the Governor? The Governor has said that any budget that comes before his desk that has any sales tax increase, he will promptly veto. So what, if you're the lieutenant governor, what do you do? <laughs> and I'm not the lieutenant governor. I wouldn't want to be in Nancy Wyman's shoes. She's a, a, a lovely uh, human being, and I've had many pleasant conversations with her. But the, the, the reality of this, either way, and we, can't, we don't have a crystal ball, we don't know which way she'll go, is that if, uh, if the lieutenant governor votes yes and passes the budget out of the Senate, it goes to the governor and he vetoes it, and we're back to having no budget. If she votes no and the budget fails, then the budget fails and we have no budget. So the outcome is ultimately the same if we were to get into this particular scenario. I think, and you know, I've only been up there a short time compared to uh, many other legislators, but I think that what we will see in the time between now and whenever the, uh, the House and Senate are asked to reconvene is a budget ultimately that the governor will say that he will sign if it's passed, okay? and I honestly cannot tell you what that's going to look like at this point. Um, back to my opening comment, uh, I think we are very wise here in Watertown and at this desk to have contingency plans in place, because I really can't promise you that, uh, that there'll be no cuts. I can't promise you that uh, if we get to October 1st that the uh, executive order that the governor has, uh, has threatened, if you will, and that those dramatic cuts to, to our budget, that they won't become a reality. Can you talk a little bit about the, what that'll do to the minimum budget requirements? So um, there, was, uh, there, was a, there have been a number of uh, sessions where there have been uh, bills proposed to eliminate MBR. Okay? And depending on, on where you sit and depending on your understanding and depending on what the uh, particular uh, financial situation is in any particular school system, you either like MBR or you don't like MBR. Uh, my guess is that if, uh, if we face the cuts that were proposed from the governor through his executive order, um, and I haven't looked at the number, I haven't analyzed the numbers for Watertown, I'm sure that, uh, that, uh, that you have and the superintendent have, but that's going to put us underneath the MBR if we have a Four million dollar cut or a nine million dollar cut or whatever the whatever the amount is. So my uh, my guess would be that there will be uh, there will be some sort of uh, emergency certification that will uh, that will relieve towns of having to uh, having to follow MBR. Because otherwise we'd be in violation. Otherwise you'd be in violation. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Anybody have any questions for Senator Berthel? I wish I had better news for you. Um, you know, it's uh, it's a very interesting time we're living through, and hopefully we uh, we can get past this and get uh, get on with the business of uh, of doing the state's business, if you will, and running the government. Excuse me. Yes. Please. I have one quick one. Is there a time limit on when he would have to make sure that we have a budget by the end of the year? Uh, that's a good question, Mr. Lambert, and I'm not sure that I know the answer to it. I know that we are uh, we are in a time We've now. Never gotten where, this far. Yeah, we, this <laughs> we're, we're further yeah. we're we're as I understand it, we are uh, further along in time than we've ever been uh, in the history of the of the budgeting process in the in the state without having a budget. So I'm not sure what the answer to your question is, but I can find out. 
can get back to you. I don't know if there's, uh, Dr. Kernemal, do you happen to know by any chance if there's a, uh, a, a legal requirement for when? Not that I'm aware of, yeah. but I think we're the furthest along. Yeah. We've seen it. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Uh, one question, final question is, um, unless anybody else thought of something, um, what does it cost the taxpayers every time <laughs> the legislator gets called back in? Well, just the cost to, to light up the building and bring in the uh, necessary security elements uh, is about $12,000 for the day. And then um, it's, no, it's no secret that legislators are paid for their uh, mileage uh, from their, their home to, to the Capitol. Uh, and that's, you know, that's another dollar amount that, uh, that is added to that. So it's, not, it's certainly not free. It's not free, and the building has to be heated or air conditioned. I'm hoping that I'm hoping that we will be still air conditioning the building when we're voting on a budget and not having to heat it. But okay. uh, and then there's just the the uh, you know the time that that is lost for uh, for the pieces of the government that have to be involved in running the show when we're when we're there. Okay, uh, people are taken away from other responsibilities that work for. The General Assembly when we're in session. So, uh, yeah. May I please? You may not be able to answer this question because I, I, but I'm not sure what conversations you've been privy to from the governor's perspective. When we received the budget on the uh, proposal under the executive order, and I, I looked at the number on the school side alone, nine point five million dollars. Mm -hmm. To put that into perspective, as you know, when you said, we have a lean budget mm -hmm. as it is. But $9.5 million is, generally speaking, the complete operating budget for two of our schools together. Mm -hmm. So when it's put into, Judson, Judson and Polk, for argument's sake, Put the two of them together. That's just about what it costs to completely run both of those schools. So, when I see something like that, I I can't do anything but say to myself, "What would the governor or any legislator think a town could do to make up for that kind of money?" So, Dr. Carnival, that's a great question, and I think that the answer. The answer. Were you through? I'm sorry. Yeah. No. I and that's why I'm saying I don't know that you really have the answer. No. I. I. I, well, I don't. I don't. Fathom what the I don't answer have, could be. I, I have no no way to know what what uh, Governor Moy uh, was thinking. Okay. Clearly. But I can tell you this, um, and this is from comments that have come out of the uh, Office of Policy Management through uh, Ben Barnes, who of course you know has become a household name for certain people. Uh, you know when uh, when Ben Barnes was questioned about why we kept on taxing hospitals in Connecticut. His response to the General Assembly in a finance committee meeting that I was sitting in was, well, why do you rob a bank? You, know, you rob a bank because that's where the money is. Okay? So when you look at towns like ours, which has, generally speaking, has been run in a fiscally responsible manner through the work that this Board of Education does with putting forth uh, responsible budgets Hey, through the work that's done on the town side with responsible budgets, we pay our bills, our fund balances are healthy. The governor and Ben Barnes have said that, uh, Ben Barnes would say, and I may not get the quote exactly right, but he said something to the effect of a low mill rate in a town is an indicator that the town has a higher ability to pay more taxes. So if you're the city of Hartford at 75 mills, well, you can't afford any more taxes. If you're the town of Watertown at 32 mills, well, yeah, maybe you could stretch a $9.4 million loss to the education budget. I think if, if, uh, if I remember what Bob Scannell told me in the last couple of days, is like a six mill increase, seven mill increase. Mm -hmm. So we go from 32 to 39 or 40, right? And we can afford it. That's the message that's coming out of, out of now I'm not saying that Governor Malloy has said that, but his policy chief has certainly made comments to that effect. So I don't know, I, I, I can't answer your question for obvious reasons, but I think that that's a, uh, a bit of an indicator of, of the, the climate that we're working in and the, and the mindset of what's going on in, in Hartford. And on top of that, because the city of Hartford is on the verge of bankruptcy, we should be 
be willing to pay more to help prevent that from happening. Okay? And that's in part, that's going back to the, the budget proposal that we may ultimately vote on. Because it will include a $50 million bailout to the city of Hartford in the first year. And another $50 million in the following year. And I guess if that had been part of our financial planning in Watertown, then that might be something that was considered if we were told that there had to be a line to help bail out places right. that hadn't been as right. fiscally lean as we were, we might have considered that. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, there, there's no money left. To no, I understand that. I understand that. And that. I think that, Madam Chair, if I Please. may just uh, conclude with one, one piece of information that uh, I think was in the news uh, beginning of last week. Uh, the Office of uh, uh, OPM has actually put out a, uh, a very sternly written letter to the uh, financial directors and the leaders of every town in Connecticut asking for full disclosure of their financial statements, which the towns have no obligation to provide, by the way. And some towns have said, uh, no, uh, I, don't, I don't know if I know what we did here in Watertown, but, uh, but some towns have said, okay, and there's a reason for that. <laughs> they want to see how much money we have in the bank, right? And it's going to just prove out their theory that if you have a mill rate of 32 and you've done a good job running your school system, you've done a good job running your town, and you have money in the bank, then you can afford to, to give some of that out. I appreciate it. You, you yeah. actually did answer my question because I, I didn't truly mean it in a facetious way. I, no, I know I'm that. I'm thinking sure. through what is the mechanism for recovering that kind of money right. in the governor or the legislature's eyes because... And I well, guess it it's, is just it's, increase the mill rate. Yeah, it's, um, it'll be an increased mill rate at the local level. It'll be an increased sales tax rate, and it'll be ad additional taxes on things that we're not currently collecting sales tax on. That's unfortunate. Mr. So, Mikowski? Yes. Madam Chair, I'm not sure if uh, Senator Barthel can answer this or anybody on the board, but just curious, how does the state finances impact um, the ability for the town to borrow money, bond ratings, things like that? We know that we have... Um, you know, some areas within town that in the coming years will need attention. Um, and I'm just curious how what happens in Hartford impacts our ability here in Watertown to, so to do that kind of business. I wish uh, Frank Nardelli was here because he could really answer the question a lot better than, than anyone else. But at, if, if we were, as I understand it, if we were looking to bond something today, right now, with Watertown's current fiscal health, it would be very easy for us to do that. We have a very good you, bond rating. We have a very good bond rating. <laughs> right. If, if what we believe might happen is going to happen, where we have either costs that are thrown back to the town, mm -hmm. like part of the, the teacher's pension <coughs> fund and, and, and whatnot, then the, I guess the, the liquidity of the town goes down. Okay. Okay? Its ability, therefore, to uh, – it doesn't lose the ability to repay. It's not like it's right. junk at that point. But – Makes it a little bit harder on, on some sort of uh, some sort of scale to for the town to repay. So it makes it a little harder. And then as that continues to as those uh, those balances continue to erode, it becomes increasingly more difficult. And that's what the state of Connecticut is faced with now. And the city of Hartford can't basically can't borrow money. It's very expensive for the city of Hartford to borrow money right now. Got it. Thank you, Mr. You're Lambert. Mm -hmm. oh, Senator Berthel, uh, I, I I don't know the answer. This you might not know either, but can a state go bankrupt? No. The state cannot go state bankrupt. Of, the state cannot go bankrupt. The town can go bankrupt, but the state cannot. And I and and it was explained to me, and it, it's it's a it's a um, entry level college class to understand why. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. But no, the state cannot go bankrupt, but a town or city can, and they do. Detroit was, I think, the biggest yeah. municipal bankruptcy in the history of the country uh, a number of years ago. And there are some that have said, um, non-partisan non opinions, or I should say bipartisan opinions, that have said that the best thing that, that might happen to Hartford is for it to go bankrupt. Because it would come out at the end of the day, uh, at the end of that process, it would come out and would have the opportunity to be, to be very prosperous. It's like just the pain, it's the pain between, no, water, right? you know. So. Senator Brothel, I just want to thank you for being here. I want to um, just take a step back for a minute um, before you leave and just... Uh, share with everybody that there have been multiple phone calls and texts and emails that have come at least from my house and, and my cell phone and my email along with many other people at this table and you have been very gracious in explaining and listening to the venting 
um, and, and quite frankly, having to take responsibility for some things that are completely out of your control. Um, appreciate the open lines of communication. I know how much Watertown Public Schools education means to you personally. Certainly. Um, your foundation is right here at this table, and I know you'll be fighting uh, for, for every single dollar um, where, wherever and whenever you can. Yeah. So I appreciate well, thank you. it. Thank you, Leslie. That's very kind. And, uh, um, and, and that process remains open. Uh, you all know how to get in touch with me. And uh, as we have new information, certainly uh, we'll share it. But, okay. uh, but thank you for that. That's very kind. Thank you. Uh, and thanks for the opportunity. Thank you for being here on your one night off. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and I am going to take my leave, if that's okay, with all of you. So, Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay. Moving on to the superintendent's recommendations and report, item F. Thank you. Uh, as you know, we had faculty and staff return today. Uh, today is the first of the first three days of staff and faculty training, and uh, the culminates to some degree on Wednesday with convocation, which we are honoring a tradition we began last year and having convocation on the last of the training days instead of on the first day. Uh, part of that being a, a philosophy that we have put into effect that we let people come in and completely get ready for students to the ability that they are able to before they come together and we talk about our plans for the year and that way we're more ready to open and our staff and faculty feel that they are settled in um, and also because I think it's pretty powerful that the last thing we all do together before students come is be together and have these kinds of conversations um, about what the year will bring so we're looking forward to that again the convocation and you know you have all been invited is when uh, Wednesday August 30th we have uh, registration at 730 in the morning and we will begin the program promptly at 815 uh, our goal this year is to maintain a 45 minute we have an ambitious goal of a 45 minute <coughs> convocation so uh, as you know we also recognize our teacher of the year again at that uh, convocation so that's always one very nice part um, I sent a district welcome letter <laughs> to families over the weekend. Um, in addition to the letter I sent out to faculty and staff. Um, and as I've done that, one of the things that it may seem odd that I was struck by, but literally was struck by it to some degree, is that this, this is my fourth year and this is the fourth time that, <laughs> that I've done this. And I think I've said before, in some respects it feels like I just started and some it feels like I never did anything else so it kind of depends on the, <laughs> the day that you asked me but um, I think every year we have come a little bit closer to getting this opening to be what we would refer to as the ideal um, we dealt with uh, a number of issues concerns uh, busing types of things as we as we do every <laughs> summer but I would say we actually had less this year um, one of the things that we have really worked hard at, and I'll thank Mrs. Brown for this also, is having an eye on transportation and trying to be more accommodating to parents and neighborhoods and with an eye on what's, as always, best for students so that we have made a number of changes to bus routes and bus stops and, and those sorts of things. And um, our parents continue to often have very good ideas about how things might be able to be different. And we have done the best we can with all of that. What I will say on the flip side is, after now doing it for this long, we are stretched very thin um, with our buses and the routes and the stops because what we had hoped for is what's happened. More students are riding the bus. And so for every good thing you do, there's another challenge along the way. And so as we're moving forward and we're looking at um, our next busing contract, I think we will have some different ideas in mind as we move forward um, for some additions and changes that aren't really possible with where we currently are. Um, but that's, that's into the future, but it's something that has come up this summer as we've dealt with some of these issues and done the best that we could with some that maybe weren't ideally what we would have liked to have done um, for the students or parents. But for the most part, we have made all of that work. Um, I also sent out a Blackboard Connect call as I've done for the last few years and part of the 
impetus there is not just to say welcome back and to remind people that we're starting, but to test out the system because, as we all know, you never know when and how early we will need it. Uh, watching the flooding and so on going on in Texas is another <coughs> example of there have been school years where our start even has been impacted by weather and or another emergency. So uh, just take this opportunity again to, as I said in the phone call, home to families, ask publicly that all of our families do log into PowerSchool, they do check their information because that's the first place to ensure that your information is correct, especially the primary number that we can reach individuals with. Um, any issues, as I said in the call last night, any issues that folks are having with logging in or with changing any of the information, um, they can reach out to their respective schools and be helped typically in the school. And when all else fails, then sometimes I have to look to Mr. Turner as opposed to last year's call where I told everyone to call Mr. Turner. Uh, <laughs> that, was, that, was, <laughs> that was a hectic couple of weeks. Um, but I think we're in a in good place this year with our power school rollover. Um, to the budget issue, as we are in both awaiting the news and investigating all possibilities, we have had to juggle two stances as an administration. One, that we make sure that our schools have everything they need to open and to bring students in and to move forward with what we've started. And on the other hand, to, as I sometimes say, pump the proverbial brakes and go into a holding pattern to some degree until we can finish sorting out um, these budgetary issues. And again, be in hopes that we're not talking anywhere near $9.5 million because as I think was inherent in what I said, that's fairly ludicrous for the town and the board to even have to consider um, because, because certainly we are going to continue to operate five schools, not three. So um, in the meantime, though, we have um, a few openings that have not been filled and we have just for the time being left that. Um, I have to say, though, we can't continue in that fashion. Um, because I'll give you an example, and I think the board already knows this. Um, one is a custodian, for example, that's already a split position between two of our small schools where we only have a total of three custodians, and one is the floated back and forth. So we can't maintain the buildings without that position, for example. But for the time being, as the shock came along with the governor's directive, we just said, let's just hold where we are right now and then relook at everything. So um, I, I am, I am going to have to move forward with filling that and, and some of the others that are still outstanding, but we'll <coughs> deal with it as it comes. As Mrs. Crowdy said, we are looking at all possibilities behind the scenes. So, uh, and as I have said more than once, if it was able to be um, removed from this budget, that happened already. So we are left between a rock and a hard place, whether they want to um, cut us $10 or <laughs> $9.5 million. It's, you know, that's, that's the place that we're in, in Watertown. And unfortunately, that's some of the result of being as fiscally responsible <coughs> as, as we have really tried to be, as you know. Um, we had popsicles on the playground, the first of the three today at John Trumbull. Um, very well attended, as you know, we started that a couple of years ago so that all students from pre-K to second grade are able to meet their teachers. And um, I think we had probably about 150 second grade families there today. Uh, we were expecting, well, our initial expectation was maybe about 500 families over the three days, but being at nearly every second grader family today, we may, we may uh, come closer to, say, 80% of the families over at John Trumbull coming. So that has been fantastic. I, I thank the, our parents and our families for coming. I thank Mrs. Mecca and all the teachers and the staff and the, and the custodians who worked really hard to make sure all of that was ready to go today. Um, likewise, we had um, Swift's sixth grade orientation on Friday, which was also very well done and very well attended. So our normal pieces are already in place or have fallen into place, and we are just moving forward and... Uh, I think I speak for most, if not all of us, when I say we are all looking forward to what I call the normalcy of 
of the hustle and bustle of a school year. Um, this is like waiting behind the scenes with the curtain down, and and we're we're ready for the uh, production to actually begin. We're really excited for our students to return. Um, most of the appointments that you see on the agenda tonight were, were actually done at the end of the school year and since the last board meeting and, and the majority of them are um, the advisor positions and so on that are governed by the teacher's contract. Uh, we have a, a few teachers that we still had not gotten to here. Um, I have two positions that still are not um, solidified and, and therefore aren't here. Um, for one, we just, at the uh, call the 11th hour, found a long-term substitute math teacher for Swift Mill School, for example. It's been a very difficult position to fill, as math and science often is, and um, we'll, we'll move forward for the time being. Um, we've had some changes around in custodians, and um, we uh, are sorry to see the retirement of our payroll officer, uh, Lorraine Barker, you'll see on this agenda also. Um, Lorraine is retiring for the next chapter in life, some personal reasons there, and um, she was a, a difficult uh, person to replace. As you know, a payroll officer in a school district is an incredibly um, complex job, dealing with all of the different contracts and the retirements and so on. Um, it is a strong and knowledgeable person that's needed to be able to manage all of that, tax, tax liabilities, TRB, and a myriad of things. So um, luckily, we have found a replacement for Lorraine, and we will be transitioning, which is another key thing, and I'm very thankful to Lorraine for doing this. She's staying on with us long enough to completely transition the person who has a very strong payroll background, although has never done it in a public school. And so there still will be some pieces to learn. So Lorraine will transition, and um, obviously thanking her in person, but want to thank her tonight in public. And Mrs. Brown also for all the work that you have done with uh, the office to ensure a smooth transition there. And that is it for me. All right. I would like to make a comment on your update. It is a drop in the bucket of what you have done and what your team has done between the last board meeting and this board meeting. Um, <laughs> while I appreciate the update, um, we'll just have to take it for granted that we all know the amount of work that has been accomplished this summer. Um, I can understand why you're thankful that the students are coming back, not only because that's your first love, but also it might serve as a small distraction <laughs> to some of the major work that you have been accomplishing this summer. So to all of you, your cabinet and uh, your administrative team at all of the schools, thank you. Thank, thank you, <laughs> and, and thank you for reminding me to thank um, especially our building administrators yeah. who have <coughs> bless you, bless you, bless you. Kick, kicked off another school year um, as smoothly as possible. And I uh, went in between uh, three out of the five buildings today. I'll get to the other two tomorrow. And everything is, is running like well-oiled machines. And that's due to their hard work primarily. And it's also the consistency I think that we now have together as a team because we have all done this. Um, this is now our fourth time together. So things progressed in, a, in an easier fashion for us, I think. And, and thank you for saying so. Sure. And I'm sure Mr. Brown is thrilled to have <laughs> been through that cycle with us for the first time. Uh, it's nice to see you here. All right, we're moving on to item G, discussion regarding the Board of Education meeting date change. Now, why would Mrs. Grady have so much to say about changing the meeting date, you ask? Well, it is with great pleasure that I announce. Oh, I'm going to ask. I don't like <laughs> that Dr. Cardamola is being awarded a very distinguished award. The University of Connecticut NEAG School of Education's 2017 Executive Leadership Programs Distinguished Alumni Award is being presented to Dr. Cardamola. NEAG is recognized as one of the top 20 public graduate schools in education in the entire nation. And they will present this honor to Dr. Cardamola during a ceremony that take place 
that will take place on October 23rd, 2017. Diane Allman, who some of you may know as the Senior Director of the District Management Group, said, quote, as I think about Dr. Cardamola's time in Watertown and all that she has accomplished, it's easy to see why she deserves this honor. Generations of superintendents have failed to bring cohesion to the school district and raise the esteem of the school system in the eyes of the community. When I nominated her, I was thinking of her courage, her unbelievable hard work and attention to detail, and her connection to the people. I am thrilled to be able to introduce Dr. Cardamola at the ceremony. And for those of us on the board who would like to attend, we will share that information as time goes on. So we do have the request to change the board meeting to the uh, following evening that week. And um, if you have any questions about that, now would be a good time. Can we clap? Yes. No. <laughs> You. Congratulations. Okay, thank you. I think um, I don't thought the explanation would be this long. <laughs> don't take this the wrong Well, I, I use big font because these aren't strong enough, as you know. Um, I think, though, that it, it, I would be remiss not to mention how early in your superintendent career this is in comparison to other distinguished alumni from the NEAG program that may have received this in the past, um, and we're quite proud, and, and um, we are very, very, very excited for you. Thank so you. I'll move along before, thank you. before our relationship thank gets you. worse. <laughs> 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 Moving on to um, item H, public participation. This is our first round of public participation. Does anybody wish to address the board this evening? So, no. Last chance. Does anybody wish to address the board this evening? See some consideration? Okay. Seeing none, we'll move on to I, committee reports. Mrs. Rinaldi, curriculum and instruction. Nothing at this time. Policy and labor, Mr. Vicenzi. No report. Thank you. Budget and finance, Mr. Lambert. Uh, no report at this time. And back to you for facilities, public building committee operations. Again, no report. Thank you. Governance and community engagement, Mr. Mikowski. Nothing at this time. Thank you. Item J, communications, Mrs. Wilk. Nothing to report. I have spoken enough for this evening, so I'm going to move on to the action items. The act adoption of items to be approved by consent, consideration to approve a change to a Board of Education meeting date. Is there a motion? Yes, Madam Chair, I move that the Board of Education change the October 23rd, 2017 regular meeting date to a special meeting date on Tuesday, October 24th, 2017 at 7.30 p.m. Thank you very much. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions. Motion carries. Item two, consideration of the approval of a leave of absence. Uh, Ms. Elaine Sear, a paraprofessional at Watertown High School, has requested a leave of absence, which she is allowed to do under Article 8 of the WEA contract, effective August 28th through July 1st. Is there a motion? Yes, Madam Chair, I move that the board approve of the request for a long-term leave of absence for Ms. Sear from August 28th 2017 to approximately July 1, 2018. Thank you, Mr. Vicenzi. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. Moving on to item M. <coughs> Future agenda items in board member comments. Do board members wish to make any comments at this time or recommend future agenda items? Through the chair. Please. May I add? Uh, yep. One other thing that I wanted to just bring up, and, and it's, a, it's a precursor to hopefully an entire uh, conversation. I wanted the, to let the board know that uh, Mr. Jones, Dr. Parlato, and I worked on a grant um, with the State Department of Education for career and technical education, which is something that we do every year. Um, and we use some of that Perkins funding from the federal and state government toward um, any career and technical education of high school. So for example, um, toward some of our, our, our woodworking classes and our um, computer classes and so forth. Um, Mr. Jones and I had long talked about the possibility of introducing a culinary program into the high school, a 
course, as you know, that's not something that we have been able to do through our normal budgetary process. Um, we were able to put health tech back in, but not um, at any other programs at this time. So Mr. Jones has submitted the grant, uh, Dr. Carl Otto assisted, and we'll see what happens. Um, it's not something to have an entire conversation about yet because we'll, lots of school districts have applied for grant money under this program and we may or we may not be the recipients. If we are the recipients, then we will have another conversation, but I just wanted to put it out that that is one of the many things, as you said, we completed this summer and we are hopeful that um, we can tap into some of that grant money to, for our students. Excellent news. Any questions, board member comments, future agenda items? Okay. Last round of public participation. Any members of the audience wish to address the board this evening? Any members of the public wish to address the board this evening? Seeing none, we're gonna move into executive session. Before I make that ask for a motion on the executive session, I would note that when we return to regular session, the board will not be taking any action at that time. Is there a motion to go into executive session? Yes, Madam Chair, I move that the board go into executive session for the purpose of discussion regarding security strategies. Attending the executive session will be Leslie Crotty, Dr. Carnamola, Vic Vincenzi, Jim Gambardella, Cheryl Albino, Jill Brown, Rob Mikowski, Kathy Grinaldi, Janelle Wilk, and myself, Tom Lambert. Thank you, Mr. Lambert. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. We are now in executive session. Yes. Okay.